a lot of the time you'll bump into things like the fact that there weren't only 18 Primarchs, but rather 20. Or the fact that if I were to say the Demonculaba is. See? It's kind of fun. Or something like that, but either way, you'd still wouldn't be left with the real thing. It'd be like Diet Coke to regular Coke. No, it'd be like New Coke to regular Coke. That's a much better example. New Horse. Yeah. New horse, exactly. Stay with me now. It's too late for you to leave. I am Isander. And I am Coda. And thank you for tuning into this episode. Today we're going to be doing something different. Just we a slight bit different. <clears throat> Most of you watching by now know enough about 40k for me to do an iceberg video. Now, you'll probably stick with me for most of the beginning. That's fine. I expect that. However, my goal by the end and by this iceberg that you should be seeing is for you to be absolutely befuddled and for me to look completely insane on camera. That's the end goal. So we'll see if I accomplish that. Some of this will be canon, some of this will be not. The deeper we go, the more deranged things will become with lore integrity dropping further and further until eventually we get to the depths of the abyss and all sanity implodes. What words am I reading? <laughs> What words am I reading? I told you it'd be fun. Put that away. We'll get to those later. For now, I want to see how many of you guys can make it with me. I'm sure like a few of you will make it all the way to the bottom, but we'll see. Let's get started with the beginning. This is the first layer. It's the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg. The, most of the stuff here you will know if you've ever had a passing interest in 40k. This is like reasonable stuff. It, it's reasonable stuff. It, we've covered a lot of it already here. Um, it's the five main factions, right? You'll discover Big E, you know, Emperor, worst dad of the millennium, 10 times in a row pretty much. Uh, he's the god emperor of mankind and he's their big head honcho. He, he's the guy in charge. He's currently very almost dead. <laughs> he's Right there, currently on the Golden Throne, requiring a thousand-ish people every day, Psychers specifically, to be sacrificed for him to keep going. It's a whole thing. It's not great. Bright side is, by sacrificing all those Psychers, you have a bright light into the warp, so you can navigate. He's a, he's a neat lighthouse. A great, nice space lighthouse. Exactly. Um, there's also the Space Marines. Again, you will definitely bump into these if you have any kind of a passing interest with 40k. These are... Biggie's direct creations. They're super soldiers. They're meant to be the best possible soldier, period. They have tons of spare organs, hardened bones, more muscle than an average human body could hold. They're like eight feet tall, clad in massive armor, spare lungs, spare heart. Some of them can spit venom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They have like a pre-digestive tract, too, so they can... If you do poison a marine... No, you didn't. There's a harsher stomach for things... It's... They're a lot. They're meant to survive basically anywhere, and they're meant to literally know no fear. And they're phenomenal at that. They're big guys. They are the Emperor's weapon to push back the darkness and unite the universe. They're also Games Workshop weapon to stay profitable, baby. <laughs> Space Marines pay the bills. Space Marines pay the bills. So if you like them, you will be eating well. I don't have the number off the top of my dome. Somebody will in the comments, but I would be willing to confidently bet that of all the minifigs on the table, Space Marines, if you put together Space Marines, Chaos Marines, and Primaris Marines, if you put all of them together, I'd say one in five armies are Space Marines, up to maybe one in three at the most. They're, they're popular. They're hilariously popular. And... You will not see anything major happen in 40k without Space Marines. Nothing being gets by them. Pretty, pretty much. They're pretty much omnipresent in all 40k media, but your average person will never see one. They're hilariously rare because it takes so much effort to train them, to armor them. I mean, just finding a kid who can take having a third lung shoved in there is a whole thing. So, you will probably never see a Space Marine ever if you actually lived there. And if you did, oh, that's not great. <laughs> because that's something no amount of humans could fix. So, you're probably already dead. <laughs> it's unfortunate. <laughs> they are also, they, they all also take after their Primarch. So, it wasn't the Emperor, then Space Marines. It's like the Emperor, then their Primarchs, then the Space Marines. Primarchs are basically the Emperor's 20 kids meant to have complete dominion over one thing he's good at. 
For example, there's Gilliman, who is Strategy, Administration, and Logistics, which is boring. Until you have to win a war. It's boring, but important. Good, good luck winning a war without any kind of supply lines. It's just not possible. Same goes for the rest of his brothers. Dorn, Master of Defense. Horus, Master of the Attack. The list goes on and on and on. If you like any kind of shtick, there's a Primark for you. You like vampires? There's a Blood Angels. You like strategy? There's the Ultramarines. If you have a niche, there's a Space Marine Legion for you somewhere in there. If not, a chapter for you at least. The next thing that you'll definitely bump into that's on this list is the four-ish Chaos Gods. Ish. Ish comes in later when the insanity takes hold for now. There's four. Four. Uh, Zinch, Nurgle, Korn, and Slanesh. And they each have... Various emotions, various pitfalls. There's a lot that feeds these pe- entities. Almost people. Things. Things. There's a lot that feeds these things, but most importantly is they also have virtues. Because not everyone's going to fall for Satan appearing in front of them. Obviously, they also have dominion over some good things, which is usually how they get you. You, you like self-improvement? Well, boy, howdy, does corn like you. That's not great for anybody else. So the, it's like a yin and yang, but just because it's 40K, there's so much more yin than yang. The balance is so off. It's completely thrown You know off. the way it's a circle? Usually it's like 90% just darkness and then 1% to offset that. It's just how they operate. And the dot in the darkness is like tiny. It's a pin. It's a no, pinhole. Exactly. Um, they reside in the warp, which is another thing you bump into. And it's just another universe stapled under ours. That's it. Everything chaos comes from the warp, but not everything in the warp is chaos. It's an important distinction to make. So that's kind of their turf. That is their home. And every time the warp gets into or next to real space... Not great. Then there's the Eldar, space elves, pretty much. I'm I'm gonna be fairly reductive here just because most of you would know this already. But it's what it's, it's what it's space elves. It's what they are. They're space elves. Very fast, hit very hard, and they're all incredible psychers. You have the Tyranids, which are just every hive mind ever. It's an unending tide of bugs that's controlled by an unfeeling greater mind that connects them all bugs 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 bugs. they will strip it of but because it's 40k it's ratcheted up a bit so it's not just oh no they got every living thing it's oh no they ate the atmosphere too (laughs) great if you've ever played in endless space 2 these are the cravers on steroids yeah it's it's horrifying stuff really good fun and they have some phenomenal new models that come out that came out recently so then there's the guard. These are the Imperium's foot soldiers. Meat for the grinder. That's it. They are really, really cool in the sense that it's humanity going up against unbeatable odds, but also they just get curb stomped all the time. It's kind of their narrative point, <laughs> which is sad for any guard fans out there, but it is what they do. Even though. In the grand scheme of things, humanity is very much not losing. They're fighting everyone, everywhere, all the time. But it's still still portrayed as they're losing, even though they're really not. But that's neither here nor there. They're not winning. They're not winning. They're They're not Stalemate. They're at a stalemate, right? And then they are... Oh, they also have no idea what they're signing up for. (laughs) At all. But they get lasers. Lasers! We love lasers. And then there's the Mechanicus. It's the Imperium's Mechanics, but instead of any kind of engineering degree, they pour holy oil on it, pray, and it just starts again. Every time you smack a remote and it works better, you have engaged in some Mechanicus tomfoolery. They also really like toasters. Like, really like toasters. Oh, God. And then there's the Sisters of Battle, which, not to be reductive, but nuns with guns. Nuns with guns! And then there's the Tau, which are the resident optimists. They're... So outnumbered, it's unfunny, but they can hit you from 10,000 miles away, and they get mechs. So that's pretty cool. We love mechs. However, it's a a constant joke you hear is if you can see a Tau, they've lost. (laughs) If it's not a glint in the distance, and then bam, you've lost. Uh, So that's their biggest drawback. At this point, you'll also have definitely bumped into the concept of heresy. It's 
pretty much everywhere in every bit of 40k media these are it's these are topics that are heretical in canon and outside of canon in our real world it's a form of collective kayfabe which is kayfabe in wrestling is when you keep the act going no matter what to make it seem as believable as possible you just never break character ever like the rock's been in character pretty much forever <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's just him at this point. <laughs> he is the character. He never broke kayfabe. It's, the goal is to make the unreal seem as real as possible. So that's why a lot of the time you'll bump into things like the fact that there weren't only 18 Primarchs, but rather 20... <laughs> or the fact that if I were to say the Demonculaba is... <laughs> See? It's kind of fun. <laughs> it's pretty fun. However, it is kind of frustrating when you're first getting into it. Because it's like, oh, neat, I wonder what happened to my favorite Primarch. Oh, yeah, he died on the massacre of... We love our Imperial censors. <laughs> exactly. Excuse it... me, our cle ecclesiarchal censors. <laughs> More of the story is, it will get censored for fun, partially, but also just as a collective form of keeping this game going. Because why not? But that's the surface stuff. You already... You definitely know all this. I've been lecturing you about this forever. So yeah, I started. But for those of you that do, you definitely know all this already. Now let's get a little bit deeper. Let's 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 break the surface here. Let's get some water over our heads. You know, <laughs> starting with pretty much the first thing you're gonna bump into if you start diving a little deeper into 40k. This is when you aren't fully immersed per se, but you've definitely fallen down a rabbit hole or two. You're 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 treading water. Your head's above water, but you're still like do mm -hmm. doing a little dog paddle. Thing. And the first thing you're going to discover is the there are no good guys argument. It's really straightforward. There are no every single faction in 40k is a flavor of evil, and you get to pick that flavor. That's that's the fun of it. Because heroes win the day with what friendship, fun colors, turning into a giant robot together. <laughs> As a villain, you got to get creative, and you usually get way more resources to do it, and you can fumble a few times and make it more fun. So, everyone's a bad guy. It's way more fun to play the villain. Oh, oh, one, one million percent. Also, everyone's slightly inept, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that, that one's just because the game needs to keep going. Also, at this point, accuracy's getting to about... Lore integrity's at about a humble 80%. 80%. In, in this tier, most of this is easily defined truth that you can find. But there's a little bit of hearsay. There's some conjecture. There's some hinting going on here. So it's 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 dropping, but not not too bad. There's there's room for um uh, uh discourse, <laughs> some argumentation about this. Yes, but um tied into the everybody sucks is also the infinite everything sucks. <laughs> this one you'll find real quickly too. I wouldn't want to live in 40k. I'll be honest. There's very few. People in 40k, anyone would do better living as, pretty much. Unless you're straight up a Primarch, and even then, you have infinite stress on your shoulders. Or you're dead slash dying slash in chaos somewhere. Or you've just screwed off to... Somewhere? Somewhere? The freezer? I don't know. The lore dimension. The lore dimension, yes. So, it's this one's a commonly held one. Nobody really wants to live in the world of 40k, because pretty much everyone knows that if we were to move there tomorrow, we'd be guardsmen. Most of us would be... Most people would be guardsmen, with the exception of the singular Grey Knight. Yeah, our one Grey Knight. Our one Grey Knight. Uh, part of, a big part of why everything sucks is the whole universe being torn in half thing things weren't great before that but chaos got a massive win and remember how i told you the warp and real space touching is never a good thing yeah they just cut a line through everything and now they're perpetually touching in that line countless worlds are lost every day oh yeah countless worlds are lost every day with more being possessed it's <clears throat> abysmal nobody wants to live there Another thing you're going to bump into, and this is where that conjecture and argument comes in, is the Lone Guardsman, slash the Perpetual, slash the Terminator, slash the Custodies. <laughs> Basically, the, the, the basic story goes, when the Horus Heresy was raging, and the Emperor made it all the way to Horus' living room and tried to make it an unliving room. <laughs> Unsuccessfully, by the way, he was, he was laid low. A Lone Guardsman rushed in between Horus and the Emperor... 
which those are two almost gods fighting. Incredibly brave thing to do. Incredibly stupid thing to do. He died. This is and this is died with like uh, all caps and spaces in between each letter. Oh, oh yes, he Horus he hit him died so hard he was flayed on the spot. Literally beat the meat off him. But that is is where the story actually splits for most people because some people believe it was the singular guardsman, just a guy like you and me or any of you watching who rushed in and did what had to be done despite knowing it was probably not going to end well for them. They just answered the call of duty. Another potential way this played out is it wasn't a lone guardsman, but a specific guardsman who's a perpetual. He'd been fighting for quite a while and personally knew the emperor, and he's the one who rushed in between them and sacrificed himself. This one hits a little... This one hits in a different way because... You or I sacrificing ourselves only goes so far, but an immortal giving up their immortality has a lot more weight behind that decision. That's something that didn't need to do this, that did it. It went, it didn't just answer the call, it went over the line, basically. There's another iteration where all that's just propaganda. Look, it wasn't the perpetual soldier, it wasn't the lone guardsman, that's just propaganda to get more people to rush to the front lines. What really happened is it's a Terminator Marine who got in between them and he got the bones beaten out of him. And then there's another version where it's a Custodes that did it. Those two are... The reason those ones hold, and I'm grouping them together because it's basically bigger guy sacrifices. It's, it's big guy. Yeah, this, these ones hold a bit more weight because... Why would the Emperor teleport a random dude onto Horus's ship? Right? Even if it was a perpetual that he knew, it's still a regular guy. He would have gone there with custodies. He definitely would have gone there with Terminators even. But a guardsman? Guardsman? Why a guardsman? Right? So that's that's where that one comes in. At the end of the day... Everyone has their own that they like. A lot of people like the lone, unnamed guardsman. A lot of people like the named perpetual. A lot of people like the big guy. It's up to you. Also, for those of you who are fans of the perpetual, I'm purposefully not naming him because I try my best to keep things light and breezy here. This is another thing you're going to bump into in this tier. There are so many names in 40k. There are so many names. So many named characters in 40k. And one of the hardest things when you're getting into it is, oh great, I want to learn about one person. Here are 30 other side characters that are all fully fleshed out. I will purposefully just not name people for the sake of, you know, smoothing things over and avoiding that feeling, unless the video specifically pertains to them. And also, specifically here, the reason I don't is because later on, as we descend into madness, I will have to start name dropping. I'll be name dropping like I attended the Met Gala for the first time. It'll be brutal, but I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna stave it off for as much as I possibly can. It's one of those situations of like you know how there's a a, a limit to how many names and faces your brain can hold. We're trying to save you guys space. Oh yeah, I'll tell you right now. One of those names is Genghis Khan. Remember that for later. Moving on though, whatever sacrificed itself in front of the emperor, it was enough for the emperor to decimate Horus, making him probably the single most actually dead thing in 40k there's no way you could bring horus back i can't oversell how gone he is he didn't just get unalived he got unexisted the emperor decimated his body and then reached into the warp and hit his soul with a stone cold stunner it there's nothing the only way horus is coming back is if some madman were to clone him or something like that but Either way, you'd still wouldn't be left with a real thing. It'd be like Diet Coke to regular Coke. No, it'd be like New Coke to regular Coke. That's a much better example. New Horus. Yeah, New Horus. Exactly. Speaking of the original flavor of Coke, let's talk about the Horus Heresy. You're going to hear this one a lot. And at this point, you're definitely going to be, what is all this? What, 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 what is the Horusy? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
What is it? What, what's what's going on? That let's let's find out. That's what that's what this one is. It's controversial because a lot of people would say it's the first thing you should learn when you're covering 40k, and that's fair. I'm with them, but it's also how you scare people away instantaneously. Because oh, you want to learn about 40k? Here are 20 books just covering this specific thing that happened, not what led up to it, and not what came after. Have fun. Have fun. You know, it's really well written. It makes sense. Everything that happens there happens for a good reason. And they do a really good job of showing why the Emperor had such a hard time winning this engagement so well. But basically, what the Horus Heresy is, is one of his sons (laughs) turns to chaos. And with that, it starts this whole chain reaction where the family splits in half. Half going to chaos, half staying loyalist to the Emperor. This rages brutally long until it comes to the climax where the Emperor is on Horus' ship, 1v1. Horus loses. Badly. He's never coming back. However, he was being amplified by all the chaos gods. So, he was able to wound the hell out of the Emperor. He, 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 it's because of Horus that the Emperor is now stuck on that throne, slowly, maybe rotting away, kind of. Mm. And that's the... Dying? The, the, Question yes, mark? Yeah, well, yeah. Multiple, multiple Primarchs are lost during this. Tons of them, which is a shame because some of them are incredibly cool. And this is something that definitely deserves its own, not even just episode, but probably its own playlist in the future. Because there's a lot that goes into it. And again, it's super well done. It is some of the best writing in there. I really, really like it a lot. It's just daunting. It's just daunting. Moving on. To the other things I have in this tier, we have Sly Marbo. Sly Marbo. Sly Marbo. He's a jungle fighter. Uh, this one's just a reference to Sylvester Stallone. Sly Marbo, Rambo, mixed about. That's, that's, that's all it is. It's He's just Solid Snake and Chuck Norris had a baby. He's taken on entire armies and just beaten them by himself. He's beaten an entire Bane Lord Titan by himself, which is... A walking cathedral with guns worshipping chaos. It's a whole thing to fight, and he fought it all by himself, and won somehow. He is just the Imperium's version of Chuck Norris, a guardsman who's done it all. Jesus can walk on water, but Sly Marbo can swim through land. (laughs) Sly doesn't jump, he kicks the ground away. At night, every god of chaos checks under their bed and their closet for Sly Marbo. Sly once threw a grenade and killed five orcs, and then the grenade exploded. (laughs) They once named a bridge after Sly Marbo, but they had to quickly rename it because nobody crosses Sly Marbo and lives to tell the tale. Ugh. That's all it is. It's so dumb, but so fun and... Do you see what I was telling you about? How we're getting to the realm of how much is this accurate? How much is this? What are we doing? What are we talking about? Uh, Here you will also encounter the fact that the Emperor had 21 sons. 21? 21. 21. Twin Primarchs, Alpharis and Omega, and two others that were very redacted. They were very redacted for doing something. We're not sure what it is. But whatever it was, it was bad enough for the two of them to be completely removed from history. They were expunged, basically. And it's one of those things where if you were to ask it in canon, you'd just be black bagged for it. You, you, hey, why are there some statues? Mi-? And you wouldn't be seen again. The streets are saying that the 11th Legion are making a comeback, but who am I to say? Moving on to the old ones. This one is a bit of prehistory. They are one of the first intelligent races in the galaxy and they are very potent psychers they are they are incredible it's implied that they probably built the webway they're the ones responsible for creating orcs herud eldar necro like it, the list goes on and on and on and not all of those are things they created by the way some of those are things they uplifted it was already there and then they buffed it up but moral of the story is they were hilariously strong They were huge. They were huge, and they kind of had free reign over things. They they were... 
they were kind of running the game until the Necrons really, 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 really wanted to not die of cancer anymore. And in doing so, they made a deal with these things called the Catan. See, we're knocking out these points quick. Settlers of Catan. Kind of. <laughs> they are, it's, it's, it's Galactus. It's, they're star-eating gods of the real world. That's, that's the main difference between them and the uh, old ones. The old ones are mostly warp-based, and they do a lot of warp shenanigans. shenanigans. Um, the thing that makes the Catan scary is they can knit with the fabric of reality. It's horrifying stuff. They got very strong. There's this whole thing, the war in heaven. Another point on there. And it was basically the Necrons and the Catan versus everyone. <laughs> and they didn't lose, which is the important bit. That's the important bit. But they were completely gypped. The Necrons were completely gypped. They lost their bodies and their souls, and they were eaten by the Catan, as was a lot of other stuff that was eaten with the Catan. Long story short, war, war raged. Old ones are basically extinct. Catan were, the Catan won, but then the Necrons pulled a sneaky move and killed them when they were See, celebrating. I pulled a sneaky on you. Exactly. Killed them when they were celebrating and shattered them into these shards that are all over the place, in theory, on paper, if you glue enough of them together, you could get one, but it's a little difficult to. Especially when it seems like the Necrons have a very tight grip on most of them. So a lot of them, we don't even know where they are, is the main thing. Um, but yeah, so that's what was going on then. In other, I'm not going to say prehistory, because this one is recorded. It's the dark age of technology and the age of strife. We're getting deep now. Those are things you will not have heard unless you've been... In Dig this, it. You, you, no, you've, you've had to have been in this rabbit hole. Yeah. But the this one is really close to home because it has and probably even could happen again in our world. It's basically... Humanity was at its prime in the... It's called the Dark Age of Technology. But it, there was actually a Golden Age. It was They were in their prime then with tech so advanced that today's Imperium still struggles to replicate it. It's a whole thing when you find an untouched blueprint from there. It, you, things change rapidly. It's incredible. But uh, Psychers started popping up everywhere. And they make phenomenal portals for demons to walk through. That paired with 40k being 40k, everything sucks. It descended into chaos and madness very quickly. Huh. And with that, most of that information was lost. It's, it's, it's their version of the burning of Alexandria. You know how in our world countless, countless hundreds of years of research and development by real human people has just into the ether, either due to poor storage, honestly, just time itself, frankly, will do that a lot. Or a fire. Mm -hmm. Tides, nature, war, famine, all this stuff has robbed us of a lot of advancement that, who knows, we may have been further ahead today. Who, maybe not, but who knows. That's This is their version of it. And it's actually the reason why the Emperor decided, all right, enough's enough. I'm going to unify you guys. Clearly. We need to literally get our shit together. Clearly you guys aren't capable of doing this on your own. Very reductive. There's a whole thing about these. But that's, that's, that's the basic gist. But that is only one of Chaos's hobbies. The main way they stay busy is with this thing called the Great Game. It's another point on there. It's keeping up with the Kardashians. That's that's it. Think your 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 favorite trash TV show. That's what the Chaos Gods are doing. They're constantly beefing for no reason, for no reason, stabbing each other in the back, f only because they like the drama. That's it. They love the drama. That's it. They live for it. They it it serves in a sense, in a greater, less trash TV sense. It's the universe. Perpetually staying in constant balance. I like trash TV better. But basically, every Chaos God's realm will wax and wane as they get stronger and weaker, as they all infight, basically. Every single Chaos God is trying to win, except for maybe Zinch, because he just he just loves this. He just likes the game. He's, he, if Zinch if were to win, there's a good chance he'd say, run it back, and just give up. Zinch is just a gamer. He, oh, oh, one million percent. He's, he's toxic. He's toxic. He's, he's doing it for the love of the he game. He plays League. Yeah. So that's the great game. It's not the most productive thing the Chaos does, but it's a hobby. It's 
it's how they stay sane, I assume. They do work together on occasion. One of which is the Horus Heresy, like I mentioned, but very few times they'll all go, okay, 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 hold on. Something will screw up our playtime if we're not careful. And so they will focus up, they will get that done, and then immediately go back to their infighting. It's just the way they are. At this point, you will also discover the various Legion's shticks. I'm rolling a bunch of stuff together here into this one. It is basically, you're fresh-faced, you're happy, you found a, le a Legion you like, and you're getting ready to paint them when the finger on the monkey's paw curls. <laughs> and you discover their biggest pitfall. If you like the salamanders, that's fantastic. They're really nice, unless you're an Eldar child. In which case, you get to find out what Napalm does. <laughs> First hand. First hand. Space wolves are literally furries. Don't at me. The blood angels have the worst case of main character syndrome, where they can literally go mad and believe that they are sanguineous, fighting Horus at the end times. Magnus did do something wrong. He did everything wrong. And a good chunk of his legion are now soulless slaves, all because Araman butchered a spell. <laughs> the Ultramarines are too busy playing satisfactory factorial, filing their taxes to accomplish everything anything other than adding to the list of long, long-named ultramarine characters and winning fights they shouldn't. <laughs> Every Legion has a pitfall, and it's fun. It's fun. It's the point of it. Let it roll off your... Just let it roll off. It's basically a collective piss take, <laughs> is the best way to put it. It all comes from a place of, of love, usually. There are people who take it way too seriously, but disregard that usually it's all it's fully from a place of love and it's genuinely from a narrative standpoint you can never have the perfect faction try though the ultramarines might <laughs> and i like them so it's it's just another part of that balancing act but it's also you know everybody screws up at one point some more spectacularly than others magnus but everybody screws up then there's also orcs or fungi in this tier I feel like you may honestly bump into this one sooner than here, but if you haven't somehow, it's a good reason why orcs are so successful is it's it's a plant it's it's a it's a mushroom. The shrooms. It, it's it's a weird mushroom, which is a good thing because when you kill them, they put out spores that will then make more orcs, and they also have a ton of spares lying around because again, it's a mushroom. It doesn't need a lot of the whole vital organ thing. So orcs can get away with losing a lot more of their bodies than most things can without going into shock immediately. Now, they also have this thing called the WAG! And it's spelled W-A-A-G-H and always said at full volume. <laughs> always said at full volume. It wow. is when a ton of orcs are gathered together, it's basically a cloud of hype. It's a cloud of hype. They're all getting excited. They're all... Getting gearing up for a fight, they're loving this, they're here for this. Again, they were created by the old ones to brawl forever. This is a key part of that brawl forever. And as more of them die, the hype builds, spores are put everywhere, more appear, the hype builds, keeps going, keeps going. If you don't stop a wall quickly, it will end your system. It's an infinite hype train. Who knows what they might do? They might pre-order a video game. Yeah, old ones were very good at their whole shtick. And another one of their... Um, Side effects, let's say, on the universe is the Eldar, whom birthed Slanesh by overdoing everything. Because the Eldar were in a position where they didn't fear anything anymore, not even death, and so to feel anything, they had to keep going to higher and higher depths of depravity. It kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going. They kept overdoing doing. And they did so much unspeakable raunch. They were liking so much on Maine, where their mom could see that a chaos god was born. Their mom joined in. Oh, God. Probably. But yes, a chaos god was birthed that way, the god of excess, the prince of pleasure and pain. Slanesh. And in that instant, something like 9 in 10 Eldar died. <laughs> they were immediately... That's not an exact figure, by the way. But they were immediately added to the endangered species list overnight. 9 in 10 Eldar agree. Uh, basically. And as a side effect of this... You know when Tom and Jerry, when Tom canonically dies and you see his... 
let me cook. <laughs> and you see his, his spirit rising from his body. Basically, that's what happens to everybody in 40k, but for the Eldar, the spirit starts rising and then <laughs> Slanesh so grabs crabs. it. <laughs> yeah, and tortures it forever. <laughs> so, that's a problem for the Eldar, and now they're trying to fix that desperately. Some of them wear rocks around their neck that will snatch it faster than Slanesh can snatch it. Others stall for time. They hate it, but they stall by worshipping Slanesh in a way. They don't worship Slanesh, but they figure it out by doing stuff that makes Slanesh happy. It buys time. Yeah, but just Slanesh won't come for them if exactly. they just keep doing stuff Slanesh. Yeah, Slanesh won't steal my soul if I stuff my pillows with your guts. So, that's the And Eldar's then stuff your guts with my pillows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is the plight the Eldar face, and they are working incredibly hard to fix that. But they're not the only ones working very hard. As are we. We actually put out Two episodes every week, one of which only goes live on Patreon. Patreon. So if you want twice the content, access to the community Discord, the monthly community day streams that we hold, and a bonus episode every week, and patches whenever we shatter a goal, which is really often. Very fast. We grow absurdly quickly. We're at 8-something right now, 8.30-something as of recording, and the next goal is a 1,000. So there's a few left. There's a few spots left for that 1,000, but... I'll be honest, it's going to go quick. So if you're on the fence, just head on over to patreon.com slash Isander and Coda. And honestly, speaking of how fast we shatter goals, thank you guys so much. Last week, I set the goal of 25,000 and we have exceeded that by almost 10, which is wow. So this time I'm going to future proof it. I'm going to add some headway because I can't keep updating. The, don't get me wrong. Suffering from success moment. I love updating these every week, but I can't keep updating these every week. So now the next goal is going to be fifty because I want ten thousand more Warhammers. Yeah. Oh Jesus. Yes. The next goal is fifty thousand. I I I'm not, I'm not even going to set a timetable because we're probably going to shatter it, and I have no idea how quickly. So we will see. It is a completely insane number to say out loud. So thank you so much all of you lastly goes without saying like comment and subscribe and we are still running our poll right now for the next video the options are the mechanicus the inquisition the sisters of battle and the assassin norm so if you want a video on either of those four things the only way that happens is by speaking with chest in the comment section that's it right now everyone who loves the mechanicus has been sweeping i'm so sorry everybody else it's not even close. The mechanic is sweet. So if you don't want them to absolutely just curb stomp it, make your voice heard. If your sister is a battle fan, an Assassinorum fan, a fan of the Inquisition, now's the time. Now's the time where the Mechanicus is going to win the day and uh, you'll be left with a, a Night Lord situation. Gone but not forgotten. <laughs> we still see you. We still love you. You'll come later. <laughs> Eventually. I hope. I'm, I'm still rooting for that guy. Of course. Yeah. So, hey, if you want it, this is the only way. We do listen, we do read them, so say it with chest in the comments. Now, back to the video. At this point, we are properly underwater. We've left the surface. We are... We're, we're, we're getting fairly deep. Welcome aboard, Captain. Most things here are now the realm of prediction and implied truth. So far, the accuracy of everything has been 80 we're dropping down to a humble 60. We're at about 60% integrity. There's pressure coming in from every angle and insanity is starting to get a grip. So, give me some headroom. Give me some grace here because there will be speculation. <laughs> there will be speculation in here. That's just the nature of these things. Starting with a simple one, the Golden Throne's failing. Straight up, uh, the chair that the Emperor is stuck in that is currently serving as both a lighthouse and a life support machine, which, wow, talk about multifaceted Mul multitasking right is there. not working at it this is not what it was made to do it's really not handling the stress of this well it was meant not for the emperor but for magnus instead to sit on unfortunately everything went wrong <laughs> and so the emperor had to be the guy sitting on it and instead of it being used as a way to keep the webway open which is this project he had imagine an ability to travel faster than light without needing to pass through Korn's backyard to make it happen. That was his goal. Didn't work out because the whole heresy thing, but that was the plan. 
they converted the chair into a beacon slash life support machine slash plug over something he screwed up under the golden under the, the palace it is failing because of all of these tasks it was not meant to do it's so bad actually that the Imperium has resorted to asking Eldar to come help take a look at it, which, if you don't know how the Imperium works, they really don't like anything that's not human. For them to let a non-human into the Emperor's home, it's desperate that's times. a big deal. And it is this Eldar that tells us that this is not some grand work created by the Master of Mankind, architected for this purpose but a slap job thing he put together out of artifacts he found. <laughs> this, again, not what it was meant to do. And like everything in the Imperium, it's a complicated bureaucratic mess. And if it fails, so goes Big E. And without Big E, a lot goes wrong. One of the first major things you're going to notice, you can't travel consistently anymore at all. Every time you try, you go insane. Or you just get snatched by demons. But, but, he has been getting worship for 9,000 years plus, And he was already immortal to begin with. So he is incomprehensibly strong right now. And there is a possibility that he would not die should the throne fail. Instead, he would rise and become the fifth chaos god, Anathema. Such a cool name. Very cool name. Such a cool name. Very cool name. Or at, at least a major force in the warp. I don't know if it would be a full-blown chaos god, but... He gets enough worship. He, he get, well, there's, it's, there's, there's more to it than just worship. It, there's usually something, some almost immutable trait that the, 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 the gods are a reflection of. The emperor isn't that. He's just a guy who's been worshipped for a while. Yeah. So, but, but... But another possibility is it could finally free him to reincarnate. That that's that's a possibility. I like this one a lot simply because what is more grimdark than the Imperium struggling for thousands of years, sacrificing thousands of people every single day to shoot themselves in the foot? <laughs> it's the most grimdark thing. It's fantastically terrible. I really like this one. Where it's it's the in a desperate bid to try and keep the Emperor going. They're inadvertently keeping him chained to this realm, tormented, never to return. So that's fun. Another thing that lends credence to the whole Emperor being a Chaos God or Minor Deity is he kind of has demons. No, no to put it. He's got demons? He's got things that operate an awful lot like demons, like Saint Celestine and the Sanguinor, where there are these things, well, St. Celestine specifically, will not die. You will kill her, she will go through this incredibly metal challenge where she has to climb over the corpses of herself to get back, which every time she dies, a new corpse to climb over, it's a whole thing. But she will be back until someday she doesn't have the strength to, but that day hasn't come yet. And the Sanguinor just shows up when things are bad. <laughs> they appear to be very heavily linked to the warp, and they appear to be blessed by something in there because they, like, when corn respawns, there's a massive gong and eight demons show up. You can't not know that corn was involved. You just feel it. You can tell. It reeks of the war god. The same thing is true of Saint Celestine and the Sanguinor. There are doves floating around her sometimes. Just on death worlds they just appear they just appear carrying around imperial sta it's it very much so reeks of divine intervention this is even further established where the astronomicon beams the light up it has to touch something eventually it touches the eye of terror <laughs> and when those two meet in that space there are these realms that are full of flaming angels that only seem to have their mindset on extinguishing any and every demon with as much prejudice as possible. You can see where the theory is coming yeah, from I can, here. I can see that, yeah. It's, they're actually so committed to this, those worlds are inhospitable. It, it's it's the equivalent of trying to settle down in a hurricane of flame. It's You, you couldn't. 
They decimate anything and everything remotely chaotic, and they seem to be coming from the Big E, or the light of the Astronomicon, not sure which. I, I can see where this one's coming from. I don't, I don't personally know where it lands, but I can see where the foundation of this it's one is laid. It's not too much of a stretch. It's not too much of a stretch. It sounds like we're right on the edge of a Chaos God, but what we do probably know is the Horus Heresy was planned to a degree by the Emperor. Some people think it's part of this great Grandmaster plan to get us where we are here, which is him about to become a Chaos God, which requires quite a bit of yoga to understand. That's a lot of stretching, in my it's opinion. A stretching. It's a lot of stretching. I'm more towards the line of he could lightly see it coming, but couldn't prevent it. This is best shown in the fact that a lot of his Primarchs have redundancies, like Dorn and Percherabo kind of cover the same thing. This isn't the only time that happens either. He almost has backups, like he was planning for half of them to go away. If you pair that with the fact that he treats some of them like, you're the pride and joy of humanity, you're the greatest of us all, and redheaded stepchild, <laughs> and you wind up with a, a decent, a, a stage set for almost half of them to go, to go awry. It, it makes sense. He mistreated quite a few of them, in very stupid ways, frankly, and the way a lot of people cope is, it was all part of his master plan. Why else would he create redundancies on redundancies like this? Exactly. But the other, which I think holds a bit more water, is he expected the heresy, like a little bit, but didn't fully fathom it. This is, it's not part of a grand strategy, it was more him being able to predict it and mitigate it, if that makes sense. This is shown really well when he's playing chess-ish with Malkador, with a number of pieces on each side, and it seems at first like just a game to test strategy. This is doing the heresy, so it would make sense that the Emperor needs to think through things in unique ways, right? So he asks Malkador to be his opponent, and they switch sides and all that, but Malkador very quickly realizes that this is not a game of just a mere game, but rather a means to plan the heresy itself. It is in this game that he quickly, quickly realizes that each piece represents a Primarch, and the same things keep happening with few exceptions. Like, for example, he discovers if he takes the piece that represents Dorn and moves it into Horus's space, he will win in the very beginning. He, he will defect. There's also some warp shenanigans going on with this. Like, for example, he knew that the three pieces representing Gilliman, the Lion, and Sanguinius were off at some point. Like, they will leave the board at some point. But he doesn't know what the hell they're doing. He doesn't know that they're tied off doing the whole second Imperium, Imperium 2, right? So, there's a little bit of warp shenanigans going on here. But the basic premise is, one of the best examples of how there are slight twists in the game is... If whoever's playing the Emperor puts the piece that represents Dorn right up in Horus's face in the beginning, the Master of Defense versus the Master of Assault, he will win. There won't be a massacre. He will actually win that first engagement, but that will push the two pieces, representing Alpharius and Omegon, to immediately turn traitor, bum rush it to the Emperor's space, the piece representing the Emperor, and kill him. Ending the game right then and there. It's the fastest way he could lose the heresy, actually. It explains why Dawn is never near Horus for most of that heresy. But also keep in mind what the twin Primarchs just did there. The fastest way to lose a heresy was them going traitor. Remember that. But yeah, a lot of the time it plays out the same way with variations like that. Sometimes different pieces would be taken by different forces. But there is one consistency, and that is... Whoever is playing the role of the Emperor, be it the Emperor himself or Malkador, can never truly win. Ever. The best outcome for them is a draw, and there are various scales of that draw. So, the Emperor is always playing to go even, or as even as he possibly can. To me, that doesn't really seem like a grand strategy plan that he put in place millennia ago, rather a really bad hand that he is... At his wit's end, trying to play. He's trying to cope. To the, the best of his abilities. And genuinely, the outcome we have now could be the best that he could have scrounged together. Considering how... Again, there's an outcome where he just loses in the beginning. <laughs> there's no proper heresy. He, he just, just he lost. Just dies. He just Pretty much. So, 
Ultimately, this is another one like the Guardsman story. You're going to be hearing this a lot. The choice is up to you. At this point, whichever one you like more, whether it's this grand strategy set forth millennia ago for him to become a chaos god or a stressed workaholic at his rope's end fighting actual devils and just trying to hold it all together while having a family life at the same time. Whichever one you prefer is the way it goes. Speaking of the heresy, this one is not canon. This is like the least canon thing here. This is speculation. This is up to, this is up to interpretation. No, not even that. It's specul. There's not a shred of evidence for this. This is just a popular theory, which is it actually wasn't Horus who mortally wounded the emperor, but Sanguinius. Yeah. The, the theory goes that Sanguinius gave in to that red thirst it wouldn't have been the Black Rage yet because he didn't die. So it wouldn't have been. Yeah, he gave in to that red thirst of his in a desperate bid to fight Horus, and he won. But it could he didn't stop after that. He couldn't control Turned it. on the Emperor, mortally wounding him. It would explain why the Emperor hesitated against Sanguinius, because at this point, pretty much everybody knew that Horus was gone. Even Percherabo left... Like, he broke through Dorne's defenses, did the gritty for a sec, and then left. Not just because he beat Dorne, that's a popular meme, but also because he looked around and discovered that this isn't some great contest between the brothers, but just a bunch of maniacs ransacking a place. This isn't what he signed up for, is what he found out. This is a pub brawl. And the, he just didn't want any part of this. I actually really respect Perturabo. He won his 1v1 and then left, disconnected from the game. He, he, he went as 1v1 and disconnected from the he game. took his dub and left. 1 million percent. But yeah, anyone could see Horus was gone, so it makes no sense for the Emperor to hesitate. This is a solution to that, because the Emperor would, would have definitely hesitated against Sanguinius, especially after knocking down Horus. Again, speculation. No evidence. No evidence whatsoever. It would just be a very dark thing for the figure that the Imperium venerates every year as a sacrifice to save the Emperor actually being the final nail in his coffin. It would fit in. It would be very depressing. Be, which yeah, Very kind of dark. Kind of fits into the whole vibe. But, like I said, purely speculation. Another fairly speculative one I hinted at earlier is the Twin Pieces would turn traitor if the piece representing Dorne met Horus at the very beginning. I told you guys I'd sound insane. We're here. We're here, baby. <laughs> twin pieces? Horus? Yes. Dorne? What? Yeah, the twin pieces representing Alpharis and Omegon are the fastest ways the Emperor, one of the fastest ways the Emperor could lose that game. Meaning that if those two both turned traitor for real and put their spines into the heresy, the Emperor was boned. <laughs> So thoroughly boned. But that didn't happen. Instead, they did lead several assaults, but it wasn't anywhere nearly as effective as you'd expect the CIA faction to be. It almost looks like they're testing defenses and showing off where weaknesses are. But they're also hitting pretty hard if they're limit testing. You know, it's, it's like hiring somebody to break into your company, and yay, they broke into the company. But they shattered every window in my house in the process? I mean, I knew there were weak points. Thank you, I guess. So. But this wasn't really in the, the whole pen testing job description. Exactly. So that's where this theory comes from. Where it it doesn't. It, it goes that the, the twin print. Both of them are not fully chaos. Because if they were, their impact would be far, far, far larger. This is further evidenced with. When Dorne went to kill one of them, which he did succeed, actually, that one was barely fighting. He was just saying, wait, hey, let's talk. Hey, whoa, 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 buddy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just chat. Let's just chat. Meanwhile, Dorne was, hitting him, prank, like, bro. Yeah, Dorne was hitting him with a conveyor belt with teeth on it that he calls a, a chain sword. Yeah, it, it really did not end well for Alpharius at that point. So the theory is one of them went traitor and the other didn't. The one that went traitor was just kind of limit testing and doing the rest, while the one that did was actually trying, but because not both of them were on the side, it didn't result in a clean sweep for Chaos. Meaning that in canon, what had happened is, and I'm going to need you to stick with me here, get a pen and paper if you need. 
<laughs> Dorn killed one of them that was probably loyalist, and that loyalist was Alpharius, and his name was taken by Omegon to honor him, even though they had previously switched names, so maybe it was Alpharius pretending to be Omegon, they took Alpharius' name in honor of Omegon pretending to be Alpharius. See, it's not that hard to discern. Moral of the story is, he's definitely not not a traitor. Maybe. For now. What? What isn't hard to know is how the Emperor responded. <laughs> We're just going to carry on from there, by the way. Go on. Because that made sense. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> oh, you won't be... You, you will not make it much further than this. You will not make it much further than this. <sighs> the Emperor nowadays is just a really powerful perpetual, is what they call them. Functionally immortals. But in the first edition of the game... He was the collective sacrifice of a bunch of psychic shamans who were all very, very powerful in their own right with the goal of creating a single person. Basically, they sacrificed all their souls together to form one really powerful soul that could fight chaos on even terms. That's, that's the old lore for the emperor. This is not fully retconned today because there's still... Like I said, we're at the humble 60%. It's only going to it's only going to deteriorate from here. This is still kind of reference when Sanguinius sees the emperor and says, "I can see more than one soul in you." And the emperor just smiles and moves on. It's like, "Okay. Mm, okay. Weird. Weird. weird." And it also makes sense for him to be the collective psychic effort of a bunch of really strong psychers focusing in on one thing because Chaos calls him the anathema. <laughs> Satan hates him. Satan squared hates him. That, that, there's no other perpetual that has that level of animosity targeted to them. It almost feels like he's something different. And that is what he was, is, maybe. Another one that's hinted at fairly aggressively, kind of like the previous one, is Ferris Manus found the Necrons first. It's why he's got the metal hands. He tried to, he tried to turn some Necrons into hands. Mm, no, it's it's in his childhood. He fought several scarabs, several mech spiders, and other things in huge complexes that glowed with green energy and had odd symbols. Oh, those were Necrons. It was Necrons. He also got his metal hands after fighting a mechanical worm made of living metal. All signs point to Necrons. Is that worm with W-R-O-M or W-Y-R-M? W-Y-R-M. Worm. worm. Dragon. Yeah. E. Yeah. Dragony. Yeah. Dragon ish. It's basically all but said that it's the Necrons, which I'm fine with. I'm okay with it because it gives him room to do things, even though they never let him do anything. The Iron Hands. Did I say warriors at one point? I may have said warriors. I'm sorry. I misspeak sometimes. The Iron Hands desperately need love. I mean, if there's any Primarch that never, ever, ever gets any love, it's Ferris Manus. Nobody cares about Ferris Manus. But I love this theory because it gives him a couple of options. A, now this would be a stretch, but it's possible that the Necrons hijack it and now they have their own Primarch, which would be a whole thing and cause a fun rift because the Iron Hands are all about augmenting themselves. Well, he comes in augmented by Necrons. Augmented, yeah. And, well, now that's a problem because half of them are going to stay loyal probably and the other half are going to go, no, those are really cool. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with the Necrons. I'm going to go with the Necron ones. So, I'd be one of those iron hands. I'm sorry to say. Oh, one million percent. I love the Necrons. Another theory that covers Ferris Manus is that he's the one leading the Legion of the Damned. There's a few other people who've been suggested as the leaders, but Ferris Manus is the one that keeps popping up. The Legion of the Damned are basically a bunch of space marines that died in the warp, probably horrifically, and stayed loyal to the Emperor. Yeah, it... Effectively, what it proves is, congratulations, you've killed a Marine. They're now regrouping in hell. <laughs> they literally took the action movie trope of, I'll see you in hell, no. and took it literally. Except they show up in real space when things are really dire, though we haven't seen whoever's leading them. But Ferris Manus is very dead, so he could be the one leading them. The mysterious benefactor. Exactly. Either way, I would love to see Ferris Manus get more play firstly because even though there are only five iron warriors fans 
I see you all, and you're all very awesome. No, really, they, they, a lot of their stuff is kitbashed together, and it's some of the most artistic stuff you'll ever see. I think I like the Iron Warriors. One, one, one million percent. Iron so, Hands. Hands. Um, I told you, this is a descent to madness, and I wasn't kidding. I haven't slept in hours setting this up. <laughs> so there will be some slight mistakes like that. Iron Hands, yes. I think, um, I think the whole uh, body modification thing is like really cool, just because, I mean, I'm a cyberpunk. Oh, and there's, 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 a, there's a lot more to them. Again, it's the catchphrase. He deserves an episode all to himself. I would love to see him come back in some form or his Legion now chapters be given more to do. Both the ideas of having him be the leader of the Legion of the Damned or being with the Necrons are so cool, it'll almost certainly not happen. But we'll see. We'll see. I'll give I'll give GW credit. They have been doing a lot of fantastic stuff. On that note, if we came out if we came out with a that deserves its own episode shirt, how many of you guys would buy it? <laughs> Oh God! Don't. Anyway, the that next its own episode. No, no, that shirt does not deserve its own. The next thing in this descent to madness is Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer Forty K are the same universe. This one comes from back, way back when they were first being set up. There's a lot of cheeky references here and there and a lot of blurred lines. Some hypothesized that fantasy was just a world in the wider 40K. Some thought 40K was the future of fantasy. Today, they're very thoroughly split. Um, but the only tenuous connection they have is the same four chaos gods. So the most they could have is maybe sharing the same warp. But if they share the same warp, then chaos and fantasy could say, mm, I'm losing space marine singular. <laughs> And that would pretty much upend the entire scale of that setting. So that one's pretty much disproven. But in older lore, it was a lot more firmly connected together. Just like what's going on here. Exactly. Unfortunately, we have hit the depth of insanity where you will have definitely heard the term demonkilaba. Oh, and at no. this point, you will probably know what it is. If you don't, <laughs> keep it that way. I don't know what Ge- it is. Genuinely keep it that way. You will probably never know until we hit... Like, I'm just going to throw this out, 100k, and the way I do it is, here's an unboxing video, nice plaque, Demonculaba. <laughs> that's the 100k special, is the Demonculaba. That's, that's, that would be the emotional roller coaster. it'd be, oh my god, we did it, Demonculaba, I, immediately. I know nothing about the Demonculaba, other than people jokingly call it the Demon Kilbasa. <laughs> Yeah, actually. And don't don't call it that, because you'll ruin Kilbasa for anybody who knows what it is. Well, Kilbasa is all we already... <laughs> it'll be fun when we get there. For now, what you need to know is it's the heavyweight champ of the gross story in 40k. For those of you who already know, good for you. For those of you that don't, really, I'm not joking, keep it that way. Keep it that way. I promise you, a lot of you, I've said this before, a lot of you have taken, have not listened to me. You have not heeded my wise words. You went and searched, and now look where you are. Look where your failure brought you. Back to me. Don't look it up. <laughs> Every person who I've seen in our comments who's just like, what's the, dem- the Demonculaba? And then they go like 20 minutes later. Oh, God. <laughs> Pretty much. It'll be a really fun episode. Next up is Erebus. Erebus. He sucks. He's the worst. He... <sighs> You don't have a heresy with well, you might have a heresy without Erebus, but you don't have as smarmy and as unlikable of a heresy without Erebus. He is so unpleasant. He's he's that one really, 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 really unlikable kid who you just can't get your hands on. He just keeps getting away. He just keeps instigating stuff and running faster than you can catch him. That's what Erebus is. He's still alive, he's still instigating, he's still annoying. And he has Lorgar's fanfic tattooed all over his face. Because, yes. Because why not? Because why not? Yeah. He is... Actually, fun, fun fact. Chaos didn't even really need to try very hard to corrupt him. You know, usually Chaos... You have visions and you're racked for days and nights. Or it give, promises you everything you ever wanted. Chaos showed up and he said yes. <laughs> Chaos said, hi, I'm yes. He, ha- he had traitor. He had traitorous in his blood. Oh, one million percent. Without him and another guy called Corferon, Lorgar wouldn't have fallen to chaos. And then if Lorgar didn't fall, then Horus didn't fall. And if Horus didn't fall, well, then you don't have a namesake for your heresy, unless you maybe do, because again, the game always showed that it had to happen, you know. But 
one of the quickest ways you can stop Horus specifically is is is, is, is stopping Erebus. But kill Erebus. Good luck, because he's so smarmy. He's so smarmy. Mm, I'm going to start a massive heresy and destroy the galaxy today. I don't think... Because I feel like it. Oh, God. I don't think he deserves his own episode, but he'll definitely be mentioned in the inevitable Lorgar episode. He's ruining the catchphrase. <sighs> Go on. Now we're rubbing up against the next tier of this one. Which is... This is heavy in conjecture. This is very heavy in conjecture. We've already been heavy in conjecture. This one's heavier. And this one states that the world eaters weren't Korn's first choice. They were his third choice. If Korn was out shopping and he, you know, went, went out to get groceries, he went out to aisle one and found the blood angels with Sanguinius painting in literal blood. And he was like, oh, this is great. But Korn couldn't afford it. So he went, okay, fine, I guess I'll go to the cheaper aisle. Go and to there, the discount aisle. And there he found Dorn building a nice sand castle. And he said, that's cool. That guy, That's a guy who can get it done. Still way too expensive for corn. I, I guess the dude had a budget problem at the time. I don't know. Drink less coffee. <laughs> but he had to go all the way to the dollar store. And in the dollar store is where he found Angron. Screaming in aisle seven. And corn went, fine, this'll do. This'll be fine. <laughs> I, jokes aside, the basic premise is he wanted the Blood Angels first really badly because that is a 10 out of 10. for Not not because Sanguinius does get, like, he does get a little bit too much love. Just a, a little bit too much just love. Just so not, not to overhype him even more than he is slightly overhyped. But for Korn, Sanguinius would have been a 10 out of 10. A warrior who's honorable in that same weird way. So it's not going to be wasted on like punting orphanages or anything. He's going to he's gonna use his strength on equal opponents who has that same fury that the world leaders can have sometimes, but contains it. They're very well trained. They're very efficient. And unlike the world leaders, you can't go, yeah, yeah. And then they'll just attack you with full force. Because it really doesn't take much to be... World leaders have walked into traps willingly. They really were the dollar store option for corn. They're not bad. It 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 it'll work, but corn corn's best like his his win con. Well, not win con, but let's say it's corn playing that game instead of the Emperor Malkador. He wanted the piece that represented Sanguinis badly. I mean, to be fair, corn's got this thing. These things called blood falls. That I think you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Would not the vampire guy fit you, in perfectly I'm telling with that? You. Sanguinius falling to corn would have been amazing. Dorn falling to corn is kind of in that same way. Corn tried hard to tempt Dorn, but Dorn is just so infallibly loyal. It it bounced off. It 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 it, it was a fire hose against a brick wall. Basically, it didn't work. And so, well, I need a Primark. I'll take the Angron. We'll take the one. We'll, we'll take, take this one exactly. Not to underplay Angron. Angron's awesome. That's just the theory here. I, I like me some Angron, especially nowadays. God, Angron's a lot nowadays. His model's really cool. Yeah. But like I said, now we are rubbing up against the next layer of depth. Lore integrity is dropping even more and more, and we are officially here. It's absurdity time, baby. Caution. Passing safe depth. Lore. Integrity. Low. We've hit the challenger deep of, of insane lore. Not yet. Not yet. We're Not pretty yet? deep. We're pretty deep, though. We're, I'd say 40% now. 40%? 40% for a lore integrity. This one is where the, the realm of just very, very niche knowledge that may come into play in the future <laughs> lives and theories that are heavily supported and also heavily not at the same time. One such example is the Omnissiah is the Void Dragon. The Void Dragon was a Catan that could control all machinery. The Emperor fought a dragon made of metal and imprisoned it in Mars. The Mechanicus reside on Mars? Void dragon. Hmm. Right? Right? Now, to be fair, 90% of the Mechanicus say that it is Big E who is the Omnissiah. That's, that's just the way they do it. However, you can't deny the fact that there was a Void Dragon Catan whose whole job was making machinery work for no discernible reason. And the fact that Biggie fought a dragon on Mars and imprisoned it, you you can kind of see how... I'm saying how... I can, I can see how 2 plus 2 could equal exactly. 4. Exactly. And 
it adds another potential ticking time bomb for the Imperium because then you have this potential story where, okay, cool, the Void Dread, like, let's say hypothetically one of those theories comes to be where the Emperor gets up, be it because he reincarnates or becomes a Chaos God, yada, yada, yada. Things are fantastic for humanity. But so does the Void Dragon. Well, great, humanity now has the Emperor, but they've lost every single competent person with technology because their god, their actual god just showed up. You might wind up with a mechanic of civil war. You might have them leave the Imperium. It would be really fun stuff and intriguing. Or the Void Dragon might just decide to violently rapture them. <laughs> They'd probably appreciate it, honestly. Being raptured... If, if they got hit with what the Necron did and they just got shoved into soulless machine bodies they'd be having a fantastic day. That would be... You don't understand. That is that is the best day uh, any member of the Mechanicus could ask for. They, they'd be ecstatic. They could get even closer to their toasters. They would be the toasters. It's all they've ever wanted. <laughs> but that one is, it's, it's, like I said, very tenuous. We don't know what the hell is at the center of Mars. Right now, best bet is Big E is the Omnissiah. But I would like to see some pressure lifted off of Big E so that he's not doing everything everywhere all at once. So that's a potential theory. Another one is Sly Marbos are perpetual. This one makes sense. You heard all the stuff he's done. The only way that's possible is he's either propaganda or immortal. Not much explanation needed there. The Tyranids on a Jungle World. The Tyranids on a Jungle World. Yes. This one is real and is happening. Basically, when Tyranids show up to a planet, they eat everything. They leave nothing behind, except on a single planet where they're building and guarding it heavily. Yeah. They're building these massive beacon pylon things that can be as tall as mountains. and We don't know what it's for. But all we know is the Tyranids didn't eat this planet in its entirety. Instead, they're guarding it viciously. A couple of theories of what it could be. It could be a beacon for the actual Hive Fleet. Because one of the theories is what we're experiencing with the Tyranids isn't the actual full force of them. It's just scouts. Which is so scary. So scary if this is scouting. So it would make sense that now they're building a beacon to bring home the proper ones. Could also be a portal to help speed things up, you know, have Tyranids disappear. Whatever it is, they're putting a lot of resources into it, and it's probably going to play a big part in the future. I mean, Gene Steelers make a pilgrimage to this place. Oh, oh, it's a whole thing. It's the Imperium has cordoned it off, and just they've written they've written the planet off. It's effectively dead. There's no point. The only people who go there are the most elite of the elite. And we're not sure what it holds, but the bugs want to keep it, which can't be good for anybody else. Another one that is... I really like this one. The Chaos Gods wanted Horus to lose. Yeah, that, that was part of the plan. It was part of the plan. This is a theory that comes from, again, Alpharius and Omega on, speaking to a couple of people. And they're given this prophecy that basically states, if the Emperor wins against Horus, then the universe will be thrust into this long period of stagnation, death, and suffering as chaos only gets stronger and stronger and stronger until an actual winner comes out of this whole thing. Basically, sentencing, even if the Emperor wins, it's a slow death after. Or, alternatively, Horus wins, but he can't live with what he did. So in fury, he rules with such a brutal and iron fist he accelerates humanity to its own downfall causing way more suffering for two seconds tops and then it's all gone so with those two options at play and let's say the chaos gods could see them it would make sense for the chaos gods to get right up until then and then whip the ru- rip the rug out from under him pull the brakes a little bit exactly just just to keep that that pain train going That's where that one comes from. It's also um, backed by the theory that a lot of people call Horus the sacrificial king. Lending more credence to the fact that he's going to start this. He's going to get this ball rolling. But by no means is he the end game. He's he's the sacrifice. Yes. So. Sacrifice. Exactly. Moving on to something that is canon and not used much, but maybe will be in the future. Fabius Biles' new men. What? I told you. I told you this is going to become wild. What? Buckle up, buddy. The new men are creations of Fab- Fabius Bild, a.k.a. Fabulous Bill or Drippy Dr. House. 
whatever one you want to call him. I like Drippy Doctor House. That's me. He is insane. He's the mad scientist. He wears a lab coat made of human skin. He's the most insane of the insane, worshipping Flanash. Okay, that's a Slanash type beat. It's a Slanash type beat. That's a Slanash type oh, beat. Oh, 100%. And he is actually one of the few things to have looked, not at Slanash, but at Slanash's shadow. Which is a lot, because it's the equivalent of looking at a deity's shadow. Which, you'd think, oh, what's the big deal? Both his hearts went into arrest immediately. He saw that and immediately started having a heart attack, which he was able to prevent. But yeah, he's one of the few to have been vibe-checked by Slanesh proper and Slanesh going, Okay. You're good. You're, you're fine. Keep on keeping on. Yeah. And keep, what, keep keep skinning people and making... Uh, uh, what's his name again? Fabian Couture out of them? Exactly. It's... You know when... This is a left turn. Do you know when... <laughs> Do you know when Red Bull sponsors something and you just know it's going to be huge limit testing, like jumping from low atmosphere or something that is just borderline going to kill you, but be extreme in the process, gives you wings and all that jazz. Imagine being sponsored by Slanesh. Oh, God. That's what Fabius Bile is. That's, that's who pays his bills. And so the new men are the pinnacle of this art that Slanesh sponsors. Art. Yes. And they are smarter and faster than any human, but have all their worst traits cranked to 11. All, all, so they're just turbo sadists. They're the worst kinds. And what Fabius does is he just scatters seeds of these new men everywhere just to instigate things. Because these are men who are stronger, faster, and smarter. Men and women, because actually, unlike space marines, these ones can be girls, who are just... Better in every way, and also worse in every way. They're, they're better, but eviler. Exactly. They will lead humanity down a very, very dark path, and we're only just starting to see the impact of these new men, left, right, and center. There's also these new... There's this subtype called Glandhounds, and their job is just to... Yeah, yeah it's, it's gross. It's a disgusting name. It's a disgusting name. Their whole job is to hunt space marines and get gene seed back for Fabius. That's it. Drippy Doctor House just has them fetch stuff. They're also loyal to him on, like, a genetic level. It's a new level of loyal. Right? It's a lot. And the new men have a potential to be quite a problem. Because imagine these very charismatic leaders start popping up left, right, and center. But they're just sadists. Every single one of them. And it's... So barely hidden. Actually, no, it's fairly well hidden because, again, they're better than you in every way. Imagine, so. imagine you're at the bar. This absolutely hot, hot guy comes up to you. He says, hey, girl, you want to come back to my place and uh, skin a few orphans and turn them into a suitcase? Answer. And we can take that suitcase and we can, we can use it to ship some more babies to Volcano or something. That's that's the tier of just <laughs> terrible they're operating at. It's one of those things that isn't a problem yet, but if they over a long enough time span, it will be. It will be. It certainly will be. So, moving on to something that was a problem, not will be, but was, the enslavers. These are actually the final nail in the coffin for the old ones. They were super weakened, but these guys are what ended it. And they're basically these alien spider jellyfish things that float around on the currents of the warp, just kind of passively, until they find a psyker they can latch onto like a parasite. Then they will use that psyker to open up a portal into the warp and let more of them in. And they can passively mind control people and things around them, so... One enslaver can quickly become 10, can quickly become 100, can quickly... And it'll, it'll burn through a population in no time. So these are like Metroids. Uh, yeah. But yeah. like bigger Metroids. Uh, exactly. So you could call them... Super Metroids. Oh, for God's sake. Unlike demons, they don't have to target psychers. They could target anybody is the terrifying thing about them. So it's a real plague that can just wipe everything out if it's not constantly watched. Scary. Thankfully, most of them are dead, and 
there is only one in the known galaxy that we know of. And it's in Trazen's collection. Of course it is. It's actually one of the few things that Trazen has dead in his collection. Yeah, this is the guy who had an entire Tyranid grouping alive. Jurassic Park style. And they've gotten out before. And he's just, okay, well, I guess I gotta go get them. This thing, he keeps dead and checks on it. Every time he walks into the room, he pokes it, to be sure. Which is hilarious. Yeah. Scary enough that Trazen has to have it dead? Yeah. Tra- Trazen has to walk. Every time he walks into the room, he still dead. Cool. He's still dead there? Okay. Yeah. It, it is terrifying stuff. Not as terrifying as naked custodies. <laughs> this one was made really popular with TTS, but it's actually... I was just about to ask, because I started watching TTS recently. Mm-hmm. I told you it's worth it. The the pillar men, the pillar men custodies. When you're adding in pictures for this, you'll find uh, old pictures of the custodies, not that far from the pillar men. Long, long before this podcast, long before anybody had told me about Warhammer 40k, I was, I was a fan of JoJo's. A friend introduced it to me, and like I got sucked into a hole. Now I look at everything and I go, is that a JoJo's reference? And it's upsetting to even me, trust me. Um, But anyway, I remember like, you know, getting to part two and seeing the Pillar Men and like, you know, looking up their theme. And the first thing I find is not the Pillar Men themselves, but the Pillar Men custodians. And I'm like, what is this? This is where it comes from. It's from really, really old lore where apparently in the shame of losing the Emperor... They abandoned all their armor and locked themselves into the Imperial Palace never to leave. In shame, apparently. So, to mourn and in a form of penance, they swore to only guard the Emperor wearing just their helmets. Which is... 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 I I very easily see why this was retconned in five seconds. Now they wear black robes of mourning, which is infinitely more edgy, but far less stupid than choosing to guard the White House wearing nothing but a bike helmet and baby oil. (laughs) See, okay, now you say that the black robes are infinitely more edgy, but they didn't specify what kind of black robes. So for all I know, these could be um, black smoking jacket robes. No, it's 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 specified. They're no, like cloaks. Don't ruin my head cannon. I'm gonna ruin this. Don't ruin no, my the, head cannon. Their wardrobe has been established. Do not ruin my head cannon. And yet it has been ruined. It sucks to suck. No, because it's still in my head. Go on. Moving on to something equally stupid and somehow true. <laughs> I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need you to stay with me on this one. <laughs> Genghis Khan is the first demon Primarch. Huh? Yes. What? Genghis Khan is not only the first demon Primarch, but there's two references to him in the demon Primarchs. Yeah, you're down here with me now. I told you we'd get deranged. You're down here in the trenches with me. What? Yes, that's exactly right. The first one is Doombreed who seems to have a Mongolian hat and mustache, which does fit the bill style-wise for Genghis. Pair that with the fact that not only did Genghis conquer a sizable amount of land, but also, boy, howdy, did he let blood for the blood god flow? (laughs) Maybe not for the blood god, but there were definitely skulls. He made a sizable dent in the population at the time. Tracks, why it would be him. But later on, there was another guy who added to the lore that said there's this massive horse-bound warlord that led his armies across the nation to ransack the land. Korn liked him so much, he scooped him up and turned him into Chaos God. That's so even if you don't think the first one is, it's just a coincidence that he happens to be dressed like him, there's an outright reference to him. So we know for a fact, with chest, that Genghis Khan is <laughs> a demon Primarch, and the other one is either Attila the Hun, or Timur, or... One of the others. There's quite a few. Yes. Or Vlad the Impaler. Nice going, Genghis. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely it's a case of 
two people had the same idea, but one didn't realize somebody else had already done it. But now we're here with two references to Genghis Khan as a demon Primarch. He's just... So he's for sure a... Gen- he's, he's for sure in there. He's for sure a demon Primarch. Yeah. Genghis Khan. And somehow, somehow, that's more canon than this next one, which is the alternate heresies. <laughs> I don't... I'm lost now. I'm sorry. Oh, dude, 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 dude. You're, you're not... Oh, we're not even there yet. We're not even there yet. The alternate heresies are... Remember in those board games how there's 101 ways this could play out, but it was always the same kind of result? Yeah. This is that taken to the extreme by the fandom. So basically, they just take the different Primarchs, tweak some things, and they posit what would happen. The most popular one, the most well-done one, the most fleshed-out one, or one of them at least, is the one where Dorn and Horus switch. Basically, everything is switched perfectly reversed, and it's super interesting. Mortarian winds up creating the Grey Knights, Lorgar becomes the Ecclesiarchy. It's really cool and really well done. Okay, Lorgar becoming the Ecclesiarchy makes sense. Tracks. It tracks, doesn't it? But... What are the other two? Yeah, the, the Space Wolves wind up with Korn. Uh, the Blood Angels wind up with Nurgle, which... Didn't see that one coming, but okay. Raven Guard wind up with Zinch. I mean, it, it... Oh, and the Iron Hands get tied up with the Necrons. They? They... they mm-hmm. God, these... It's, this, these weird levels of madness are interlocking I now. told you. We're in. We're in now. Madness has a grip on us all. I haven't slept for days working on this, and I'm going to make sure you feel that. You've literally just been summoning chaos in your room. Oh, one million percent. So, it's a really, really well done one. There's quite a few of them, too. There's one where the Emperor just says, eh, if you can't beat him, join him. And he starts a heresy. That's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. Every single possible combination of pieces has happened and has been posited, and there may be one big mega episode on all of them. Maybe the Dorn one deserves its own, just because it's so fleshed out that that's almost its own story in and of itself. Definitely worth its time. Now, you thought we were insane before. We're going to get to the sensei, baby. (laughs) Are we to the bottom yet? No, no, not even close. Well, actually, very close. We're like, the sensei are right there. We're right, right below the depths. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the sensei are retconned beyond oblivion. Ve- so, so, if they're very retconned is the easiest way to put Extremely this. Extremely retconned. But the basic premise is the emperor was alive for a while. Doesn't matter which theory you ascribe to his spawn. He's been al- alive for millennia. He definitely has Riz too. He's definitely charismatic. There's no two ways about it either. So... He probably had kids. These are the sensei. Not all of them have powers, but all of them are blanks, which is why the emperor isn't aware of them. And some of them do get powers, usually showing up as immortality and the inability to have kids of your own. Again, this was before the emperor became an insane workaholic with children he bargained with Satan to make. So he just, he was just... Not paying child support, basically, is what this posits. He was just being irresponsible. He was ducking payments. He was going to different places, having kids, and leaving. (laughs) Which is so funny to me. I really, really love the concept of the Emperor having baby mama drama. But... (laughs) (laughs) But that's the premise of the Sensei. But much like the Emperor, they don't know that he's their dad either. They just think that they were born father. It was it's just fatherless behavior. It, that's that's what they've been living life as. <laughs> that is its own theory, not theory. It's quasi can not quasi canon recon thing. It's, it's its own. It's its own entity. Th- Those are the sensei. Remember them. We're gonna put them to the side for now. We're going to go back to the mass shaman sacrifice that was needed to create the emperor. This is when it kicks in. Stay with me, baby. So. The theory goes that the mass shaman sacrifice it took to create the emperor not only created the emperor, but something else in the warp that serves as a proxy for his soul called the star child. Stay with me here. It goes just like the shaman, Biggie, in theory, could die and do the same thing the shaman did, reincarnating using the star child into something else entirely. It would take him a bit 
to fully realize where he is, what he is, and make it back to Terra. So things would be terrible. <laughs> things would be abysmal. But that is what the Star Child is. Basically, if they were to let the Golden Throne turn off, the Emperor would die and then respawn somewhere. The cycle would continue again, and he'd even be stronger for it. In theory. The problem with this theory is good luck convincing anybody to do that. <laughs> Good luck convincing anybody to do that. And the second problem with this theory comes in with a group called the Illuminati. <laughs> the Illuminati? The Illuminati, baby. The Illuminati. The plan for the Illuminati, and this is why it's a problem for the Star Child theory, is their goal was to gather all the Sensei and train them into these things called the Sensei Knights to wait the final battle when the Emperor is going to canonically die. Stay with me now. It's too late for you to leave. It's then that the plot by the Illuminati is revealed to be nothing but a ruse, and the real plan is to kill all the Sensei and the Emperor at the same time to create the second coming of a new man in the form of the Sensei Emperor. Or, you know, you just sacrificed a bunch of unwitting kids and killed the Emperor of Mankind. Or... The Star Child is what the Emperor sacrificed to properly kill Horus. So you just killed the Emperor for nothing. Or he just becomes a war entity. This is just a Zinchian plot. That's why it was quietly swept under the rug and it was all written off as a crazy Zinch cult. This Good is... job! You figured out this whole 40k thing really well. Th that's Thank just you. Zinch messing around. That's just Zinch going, hey... I'm going to play with these guys but for a little bit. But that is the entire Illuminati Sensei Sensei Knight Star Child plot. Congratulations. You're now one of the ten people on Earth who knows this. Good uh. for you. <laughs> Speaking of Zinch, we're actually going to get a bit more sane here. Um, somehow. Uh, somehow Zinch is more sane. Yeah. Somehow. He lives in a palace that is completely... It's It's... The Impossible Fortress is what it's called. Yes, this is more sane than what I was talking about. It's in the center of a maze that's only passable by the actual insane. But one person has gone through it, and it's a girl with a black dog. The way they got through is by answering questions that shattered the fourth wall effectively every single time. It's a big reference to the Wizard of Oz. Uh, but it is canon, which is funny. That's hilarious. Yes. And... I don't think we're in Terra anymore, Toto. Uh, <laughs> that's basically it. And the last thing that is quasi-canon, somehow this is less canon than the Sensei plot, is Gazgul is a reference to Margaret Thatcher. Gazgul, Margaret Thatcher. This one is denied aggressively, but... Magurk Thraka, Margaret Thatcher, she was the Iron Lady, he's the Iron Orc... He was created when she was in power. It's... And Games Workshop used to be very, very satirical back in the day. So they used to take jabs at a lot of different things. It's very possible that this was made to mock her. Possibly. I mean, if, it's, GW will deny. You say this is at the deepest level of madness. But, like, if you look at Margaret Thatcher and you look at Gaz, they share an uncanny resemblance. I refuse to weigh in on that. Let's go deeper still <laughs> to the stuff that is zero to twenty percent canon. Warning: maximum depth reached. Lore. Integrity critical. That's where we are. We are now below the iceberg. We're in the depths. We're in the, We're in the depths. The first one is the funniest one. And this is the orcs are the only thing keeping the emperor alive. This one's really straightforward. That whole wah hype train that they put out can have tangible effects on the universe. They think the Emperor is the biggest human, therefore the strongest human. So in theory, if they were to show up on Terra expecting the biggest fight with the biggest human, he would get up. <laughs> he would get up for this fight. That, 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 that's, that's, that's... He's the biggest human. There's no shot he's dead. That's the orcs. There's, there's no shot... I would love to see that happen. It will never happen. But if the orcs ever make it to the most guarded planet in the universe... And, and they're like, oh, big guy? Mm -hmm. You there? And he just... He pulls a corn and stands out. That would be fantastic. Speaking of which, 
Another theory in this poll is he is not a person or a bunch of shaman who are reincarnating in a very convoluted plot to buff themselves, but rather a dark age weapon just aping being a human. <laughs> Basically it. It's hinted at very aggressively all the time, but there's a lot of stuff that's hinted very aggressively when it comes to the emperor. There's a character who refers to him as a relic from the dark age, a weapon running around unchecked. And they're just mocking a custodies over and over and asking him, have you even heard him breathe ever? And the custodies can't. The custodies is like, the custodies can't say think about yes that. with chess, you know? So who knows? It's possible it's a weapon that was created during that golden age and just ran amok. Maybe it caused a dark age. We don't know. This is high theory at this point. What isn't theory and is a fact for you Imperial, for you Inquisition fans out there, is the first named Inquisitor in all of 40K is a blackbeard looking guy. And his real name is... <clears throat> oh, God. Obi-Wan Sherlock Hello Cluso. There. Yep. What? Obi-Wan Sherlock Cluso. That sounds like someone's self-insert character. And yet it is fully canon and has never, ever been retconned. In 1987, <laughs> they call him they call him the perfect representation of your typical inquisitor. Their best traits are shown by the renowned Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau, a tireless exposer of psychic misdeeds and genetic deviants. Yup. This is why I can never take 40k very seriously. I love it. For all you Inquisition fans, hail your god emperor, your progenitor. This is where it started. Obi-Wan, Sherlock, Clouseau. You could play it on the tabletop. You could flavor it. You, it's not been removed from the canon. I don't know how they haven't. I don't know how they haven't been sued for that, frankly. Well, I suppose oh. I suppose you could never confuse Obi-Wan for Obi-Wan, Sherlock, Clouseau. That is a very distinct character. I... I love... I oh. love it. I don't know what's funnier, the fact that that is a thing that exists in 40k, or the fact that because they're an Inquisitor, if they ever met Obi-Wan Kenobi, there would be no, hey, hey, you know, like when people find each other and they realize they have the same first name, they're like, hey, that's a pretty cool name, my guy. No, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be doing the whole, you're a what? You're a Jedi? You don't believe in the God Emperor? Exterminatus, this man. Pretty much. Ooh, something I forgot about the whole Dark Age theory is another thing that helps it a lot is the sheer gap between your average person and the Emperor. I mean, your average person's your average person. The Emperor is Satan's punching bag. They're on a first name basis. Most people aren't there. Even if you sacrifice a bunch of shaman, that's still quite the gap to cover. That's another reason that one's popular. This one I really like a lot, and this one ties to the very last one, and that is, we are the Chaos Gods. We are the Chaos Gods? We are the Chaos Gods. We are the Chaos Gods. Hold on, I need to pull this up. Give me a moment. Aha! The theory comes from the fact that uh, we, as the players of 40k, are its biggest enemy. Because if 40k was to fix its problems, we'd all complain. We'd all... All complain. We are the only group that directly benefits the absolute most from continued, unending suffering for our amusement. You've played along with us this entire episode, too. Going with the most grimdark theories I've proposed. We're playing the great game. We are playing the great game. I... We're playing the great game. Yeah! We are arranging army after army and throwing them against other armies to die and be chucked away like nothing for no reason other than sheer boredom. 
They suffer for our amusement. Does that mean Discord moderators are all Nurgle? OnlyFans only fans people are all Slanesh collectively? <laughs> Every single fitness YouTuber is <laughs> an aspect of corn? <laughs> and everybody who posts, I love posting misinformation on the internet, is an aspect of Zinch. We are the Chaos Gods. We are the I Chaos Gods. Love this one a lot. We're, we're not aspirants. Mm -hmm. We are fragments. It's it's great. I love it. Hilarious. It also ties into the fact that none of this is canon. Nothing is. <laughs> Everything I just told you, none of it's canon. This is on purpose because, and even GW themselves have said this, they're only reporting from a time when stories cannot always be true. Things are deliberately destroyed in 40k. For example, take the 11th and the 2nd Legion. That's on purpose. The reason we don't know about that is because in canon, it was destroyed. That, that constant state of flux, that constant state of unreliable narr narration leads to pretty much any of this being canon. And some of it has been at some point. See the crackpot Illuminati plot that we're now living through. Like, 20 years ago, that was valid. That was what was... That was canon. Now, you're insane, but you're kind of onto something if you still believe in that. So, it, it ultimately... I like it because it is the ultimate state of nirvana. It's when you can really achieve peace and be like, this is, this, this is just how I think it works. Cool. Everything is real. Nothing is real. Nothing is real. All of it's a lie. Everything matters. Nothing matters. Mm -hmm. It's all a lie. It's all truth. Mm -hmm. It's it's great. It lets them pivot a lot. And it also leads to, again, that fun kayfabe thing of like, well, this is heresy, so I'm not going to talk about it. I, I, I'm not going to get my door beaten down by the Inquisition. You can do that on your own I don't time. Wanna, I don't want to meet Obi-Wan, Sherlock Clouseau. Exactly. Which is... I need, I need, and I know I'm going to see somebody who's painted an Inquisition model in the form of Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau, and I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. Somebody's found, like, a random Obi-Wan Kenobi model from, like, ten years ago, and they've kitbashed it to have an Inquisitor's head on it. Oh, yeah. It'd be phenomenal stuff. And the... That's it. That's it? That's it. We've reached the bottom. That's the bottom of it. That's the bottom of it. There's a few other ones, but those ones are, like grasping at straws there's a sentence basically like for example the harad are people from the future it's mentioned in a couple of perturabo's books but there's there's a lot that goes into that but like all of these are like sand at the bottom of the trench yeah, yeah exactly you you have made it this far congratulations now it's up to you to find your own brand of insanity i've given you mine i hope you enjoyed it and i hope you appreciate it because I, I wasn't kidding i was genuinely sleep deprived putting this together <laughs> the descent into madness oh one million percent that was the point and i'm glad we did it thank you for joining us for this tour of the depths and all these wonderful god damn it can i say that yes okay cool i don't know five people died okay um thank you for joining us on this tour of the depths i hope you went about as mad as i did in the process all these names that are now scrolling by are our wonderful patrons Without them, I could not have undertaken this and could not continue to undertake stuff like this. I deeply appreciate them and everything they do for us. We will see you guys on Wednesday for the Patreon episode and Saturday for the regular episode on the winner, which is looking like... It's some probably the Mechanicus. You guys are coming out. You guys are showing up. I mean, if you don't want it to be the Mechanicus, say so with chest. That's all I can say. You you, you have, can prevent you this. You have till the end of the day. You can prevent this, yeah. You have till the end of the day. Yeah. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Enjoy chilling at the depths while I go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye and good night. And have a wonderful rest of your day.